Hello and welcome to a teaching video. In this video I'd like to start our journey looking at programming paradigms, ways of thinking about programming, by talking about one that you've seen before, imperative programming. Now an imperative is a command, so this is the way of thinking about programming that says the computer is my servant. I issue a sequence of instructions and the computer's job is to follow those instructions, to follow them faithfully and to follow them in order roughly. We'll see that the story gets a little bit more complicated than that later on. Now most of the programming languages that we are first introduced to these days, uh, such as Python, Java and JavaScript, are imperative languages. In each of these cases I can write a program that is a sequence of instructions operating on some variables and calling various methods to take action in the world and uh, I would naively expect those to be carried out pretty much in order. Now I say that these um, operate on some variables and uh, call various methods to take action in the world. The imperative programming model often does that. It's often writing instructions that are about changes and so are about what we call mutable state. So to use a trivial primary school example I might say here is a bag of two apples, I might issue an instruction, add another apple to the bag and now that bag contains three apples. Its state has changed, it used to have two apples, now it's got three apples and so that is an example of what we call mutable state. So to fix that word mutable in your head I'm going to show you a terrible cartoon of a monster and I am going to mutate that monster so that it has a tentacle and I am going to mutate that monster so it has a claw. Now this model of programming, this way of thinking about programming, it's got some attractive features to it. Uh, one of them I think is that it matches what we might do if we've never seen a computer before. So I, if you can imagine there may well be people who have never programmed a computer but they've programmed a human someone might have asked me how do I get to the train station and I might well have said well go straight ahead take the first right take the second left go till you get to the church turn right and you'll see it at the end of the street there's no computer there but it is a program it is a sequence of instructions and uh, those instructions are mutating some state in this case the state of the person their location in the world changes as they carry out those instructions it also has the nice feature that it matches a fairly simple mental model of how a computer might work. So we might imagine that we've got a processor, a central processing unit, CPU, and that CPU is connected via some wires, via a bus, uh, to some memory. And the CPU's got some registers and it's got some processing ability and uh, it's going to fetch its program and its data from the memory and so it might well say well give me give me the first instruction and that instruction might say load data from some memory location all right let's execute that instruction okay time to get the next instruction let's load the next instruction and that instruction says to add 10 to that piece of data that is now in one of the processor's registers let's execute that instruction and now 15 is in that register uh, that one's done, let's load the next instruction and that might say to store the result back in some location in memory and so we could go and execute that. So that matches a relatively straightforward model of how we might think of a computer as working. Um, but, and there was always going to be a but, uh, these days it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, our model of these instructions being carried out in order particularly is going to break down and it's going to break down largely because of optimizations, things that uh, modern compilers, modern computers do in order to make your program more efficient and to make it run faster. Um, the first place that your program might be changed and things might not happen in order in the order that you think they are uh, is in the compiler. Um, these days compilers are very clever uh, things that can do a lot of optimizations to your code. Uh, these days there's also often more than one compiler acting on your code. Uh, so I'm going to jump out of the slides here and I'm going to jump across to a little example that I've written in Java and so this example is just going to time how long it takes to do a whole bunch of additions in Java. So I've got this class and this class is called Looper 
And in this class, there is a static method, iterative sum, that takes some number n. How many additions do I want it to do? And here's an accumulator that starts out at zero. And it is just going to run around uh, n times adding to that accumulator. And then it's going to return the result. So that is just going to do n additions. This next one here, I've called it time op because its job is to time how long it takes to do 100,000 additions. And so I'm going to get what the time is now in nanoseconds. I'm going to call iterative sum to get it to do 100,000 additions. And then I'm going to get what the time is afterwards. And the difference between that is how long it took. And I'm going to return that. That is how long it took uh, in order to do 100,000 additions in Java on my computer. And then main here, the program that I'm actually going to run, it's going to call time op 100,000 times. So it's just going to keep saying, please time for me how long it takes to do 100,000 additions. And I'm just going to keep some statistics on that. I'm going to keep how long the average was, and I'm going to print out how many we've done so far, how long it took, etc. Now, Java has two compilers uh, involved. Uh, the first one is the one that you might be used to, which is Java C. So if I was to go Java C on looper.java, that would produce a file called uh, looper.class. And this is a class file, but um, it contains a digested form of the code, but it's not a digested form of the code that the central processing unit that the hardware can understand. It's a digested form of the code that the Java virtual machine can understand. And so when I run this, I'm running a program called Java, the Java virtual machine, and I'm telling it that I want it to run that class. And it's going to start off actually interpreting what is in that class. Now, Java C is a compiler that doesn't do a lot of optimizations. If I uh, decompile that class, if I go Java uh, p minus c looper dot class, it will print out uh, a readable form of this uh, the the byte code that it's put into that class file. And we're not going to go into what any of these instructions mean, but you can see that there's various stores and loads, a little bit like that model of a processor that I showed earlier. And we can see in there that there is some code for our method time op. Um, there's various different bits of code for doing things like values of stuff. There, there's there's a println coming out there, uh, etc. Uh, so this is oh, and here is iterative sum, the the method that I um, that I defined earlier. Uh, so I'm going to say take it as read for the moment that that is a relatively faithful representation of a set of a sequence of instructions that will. Uh, do what I asked it to do. Uh, go and time how long it takes to do 100,000 additions. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this. So let me go Java looper and I'm going to let it print out into the scroll buffer and uh, I'm going to then scroll back to see how long it took. So if we go back to the start on the first iteration adding 100,000 additions uh, that took it about 281,000 nanoseconds. After a little while, it's got a bit quicker. So suddenly down here, it's only 34,000 nanoseconds. OK, and it stays fairly stable at 30 something thousand nanoseconds for a, quite a while. But then if I scroll down, something strange is going to happen. Pardon me while I cough for a moment. <coughs> um, something strange is going to happen if I get down here suddenly, uh, whoops, there it is. On this particular run here, it has gone from taking 30, almost 33,000 nanoseconds to taking 58 nanoseconds. The time it takes has shrunk massively to almost nothing. So what's going on here? And what is going on is that there's a second compiler has happened on our code. And this second compiler does some optimizations. This is what's called the just-in-time compiler uh, in the Java virtual machine. Um, so if I just pop back to the slides, uh, slide notes for a moment, Java C produces bytecode that's a pretty close representation to your original code. And to start with, the Java virtual machine interprets the bytecode and it's interpreting it fairly faithfully. Once a method has been called, it used to be 10,000 times, don't take that exact number as read, but a certain amount of time, 
the Java Virtual Machine decides this is a hot method. This is getting called an awful lot. It's going to be worth my while investing a little bit of effort compiling it from this intermediate representation that I've been interpreting so far into native machine code that the processor itself can understand. So it can run natively much, much faster. But at the same time as it does that, uh, it also optimizes your code. And so outwardly, your code's going to work the same, but inwardly, the compiler's going to change it. Let's run through a quick example of how the compiler might change my code. And then let's go back to what has happened to make it take so much less time in my program. Why it's a factor of almost a thousand has happened uh, in my code. So here is, uh, and this is from an example by uh, one of the Oracle engineers when they did a talk uh, some years ago. Uh, so the, 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 this little example is sourced from Oracle. Um, here is a relatively simple bit of Java code. It says x uh, called object.getValue. And let's assume that obj is an ordinary kind of Java bean style thing. And so obj.getValue, if you look at the definition of it, it's just going to return obj.x. y is obj.getValue, and then sum is x plus y. The compiler can decide, the just-in-time compiler can decide, there's some optimizations I can do to this. That getter I know its contents, and I know it is just returning obj.x. So I'm going to inline that method. Uh, sorry, oh, it's just returning obj.value. So I'm going to inline that method, and I'm going to directly uh, set x to be obj.value rather than going through the motions of calling obj.getValue. So I'm going to inline its contents, replace the call to the function with the body of the function. OK. That's that one done, and that might save me a, a lookup in the object. Uh, but there's some more things I can do. X is object.value, object Y is object.value, but in between them, I've not changed object.value. You know what? I'm not going to do the second one. I'm just going to say Y is X, and so I'm going to remove this redundant load of that particular value from the object. All right, that might save me a little bit more time. Uh, now looking at this, I can say, uh, well, sum is X plus Y, but y is x, and so rather than adding x plus y, let's just add x to x. This is a, a, an optimization called prop, uh, copy propagation. And that might save me a little bit more time. But more importantly, this now means that y equals x, y is never used. And so y, is, y equals x is dead code. The result of that is just thrown away. And so I'm not going to do it. I'm going to throw that one out. And this is actually what's happening back in my program. Uh, so if I pop back to my code here, where I'm doing the timing, I call iterative sum and I ask it to do 100,000 additions. This method here, internally, it does 100,000 additions and it returns the result. But this one doesn't hang on to it. It just throws it away. It, it never uses the result of calling iterative sum. And so the just-in-time compiler, when it's doing its optimization, it spots this. It says, you're not using the result of that. And it's not got any side effects. It doesn't do anything with any, any effects anywhere else. That is dead code. I'm just not going to do it at all. And uh, so if I pop back to my scroll back, this is why it has gone from 32, uh, almost 33,000 nanoseconds to 58 nanoseconds. It's not because adding those additions has got so much faster. It's because the Java virtual machine has realized it doesn't have to add them at all whatsoever. It's not doing it. Um, and so my code, that part of my code, has effectively been thrown away. Um, now, it has to be a little bit clever about how it does this, uh, because it could be that that code has some other effect, or it could be that I, I was going to use that value. Uh, but so it has to do something that's called escape analysis. Can this variable escape the method? And so if I pop back to my code, here I'm not doing anything with the result of iterative sum. But up here, I've got a public static long escaped. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say escaped is iterative sum. So now something outside this function is affected by calling that particular method. The result 
uh, it does escape this particular function call. And so now if I go back to my terminal and I recompile my code and I rerun my code, I should see, and there we go, if I scroll back up, okay, it starts off taking roughly as long because that was all when it was interpreted. And now there is a point at which it gets faster. Uh, so it's, uh, sorry, just trying to find it. Uh, it's a little bit harder to find now. There we go. Uh, just here, it's gone from, in that, ca in that case, um, almost 87,000 nanoseconds, but it's not dropped down to 58 nanoseconds. It's dropped down to almost 3,000 nanoseconds. So it has just in time compiled that, but it hasn't been able to remove the additions altogether. It's not been able to eliminate that code because it is no longer dead code uh, because that the result of iterative sum escapes the method. Uh, so if I put that back though, just to prove that this wasn't made up, and I rerun it again, bang, there we go, down to 40 nanoseconds, uh, something super fast. Uh, you will notice later on it jumps back up again. Um, Java's story is even more complicated. It doesn't just have one just-in-time optimizer, it's got two. And in this particular case, it so happens that when the second one hits, uh, it backs off the optimization. Um, I'm not sure if that's because it's smart enough to realize that I'm actually I'm, I am sort of using the result because I'm using the timing result of how long it takes. Uh, I don't know, that, that's speculation. Uh, but so there we've got a, an example, even in a really simple program, just timing how long it takes to do some additions, where the compiler goes and changes my code. And the code that I thought was being run, I thought I was timing how long it takes to do 100,000 additions, where later on it turns out I wasn't because the additions, they were never happening. Uh, let's go back to the slides. Uh, so the just-in-time compiler has taken my code and it has put it down into something that the processor can understand. But then the story gets complicated again because the processor also optimizes my code. Even the hardware inside my computer goes and changes the order of those instructions. Uh, now, in this case, I can't show you the example quite as easily. I'm going to have to just explain it against an illustration. Um, but so this is an illustration of what might happen inside a processor. And so imagine these clock cycles, the stages of uh, processing going by. And in this particular illustration, we're imagining a processor that has four stages to what it does to execute an instruction. It has to fetch the instruction. It's got to decode the instruction and work out which bits of processor machinery are involved. It's then got to execute the instruction and then it's got to write the result back into the registers on the processor, the local bits of memory that are on the processor. Uh, and so that is four things uh, that it has to do. Now, in times gone by, one instruction might go through and then the next instruction would go through. Um, but processors these days, they like to optimize things. And so they like to be like this picture where you've got a sequence of instructions and they are just kind of going through like a train. And so where the green one is in stage two, well, the purple one is already being fetched. The green one's being executed. Well, the purple one's already being decoded. The green one's being written back at the same time that the purple one is being executed. So that kind of keeps all those stages filled and it helps the processor to run faster. Only there's a problem. What about if statements? What about branches in my code? It might well be that this instruction here is part of an if, and depending on the result of that if, maybe the purple one's going to need to be run, or maybe the blue one's going to need to be run, or maybe a totally different one's going to need to be run. Uh, and so there would be this question of, OK, so every time I come up to a branch instruction, does that mean I have to wait until I get all the way to stage four and I know the result of that um, that, that uh, branch equals or branch less than or whatever the branch instruction is, uh, that conditional instruction, uh, before I can uh, start loading the next instruction because I don't know what the next one is to load otherwise? So these days, what processors do is they go, no, 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 I don't want to have have to have bubbles in my pipeline. I don't want to have to slow down my pipeline every time I hit something that's conditional or every time that I hit something where there is a branch. Instead, I'm going to take a guess. 
I am going to uh, start optimizing things. I'm going to do things like, well, OK, I'm going to find a few instructions that I know are going to need to be executed anyway and that I can reorder safely. And I'm going to pack them in behind the branch so that I can delay delay my choice as late as possible. Uh, but I'm also going to take a guess as to which way this branch is going to go. Let's assume this branch, branch equals, let's assume it was equal. Let's assume it comes out to be true. The purple instructions get the, the one that's scheduled to be uh, done next, if that's the case. I'm going to start fetching it. I'm going to start decoding it. I'm going to start executing it. Oh, at this stage, I find out I was wrong. Never mind. I've not written back the results of this piece of code that I've just executed. So I can just throw it away. I can just pretend I never did that and go and load the right one instead. Um, but in the common case, if I get the guess right, yes, I was right. I can keep using it. I can keep letting things flow through. Um, so these are optimizations that happen down in the processor. It turns out also, um, this just might be of interest, uh, that this is also a uh, a source of a security flaw that got found, um, uh, that, that made the papers at the time, one called Spectre, which is what's called a timing attack. So if it is speculatively executing an instruction that it might not really need to execute in the end, well, in its speculative execution, it's going to have to go and load any data that it needs. And so it's going to have to go and load data from memory into the uh, onto the processor, onto the local cache. And if it throws away the results, well, it's still going to have loaded that data, it's still going to be sitting there in memory. And so I can run some other call that's going to rely on that piece of data. And I can time how long it takes. And if it's really quick, I know that that means that the, the data is sitting there in the cache. And if it's really slow, I know that means it never got loaded. And so you can start doing things where you start training the branch predictor so that it's going to go in particular ways so that it can load the data into memory. And then you start doing timing on other instructions to start working out uh, whether it's in memory, or more to the point, not so much whether that one's in memory, as to whether it bumped your other piece of data out of the cache. And so your other one takes a little bit longer. Sorry, that is possibly a little bit of a, a an unwieldy explanation of something that's just kind of in, of interest anyway. Uh, but so the, the, the core point of this is that the processor does optimizations on the instructions that have come out uh, even of my compiled code. Uh, and then there's this side effect that uh, where the processor takes a wrong guess, well, it might actually have a side effect on the processor of having loaded something into cache and that might leak whether or not the test succeeded. The next one, though, is that your code isn't just running in one place. I showed a picture that had one processor. But these days, processors have multiple cores and each of those cores has their own little bit of local memory and they're all operating in parallel. And you also might have more than one computer involved in your program. Your program might be distributed across uh, multiple processors. And so that gives us this little problem of, well, here's my bag of two apples. And say I wasn't, um, well, say let's add a, an apple to it. OK, that all seems well and good. Suppose instead my process was going to take away an apple from that bag. And so suppose I've got two parallel threads going on that are going to take apples out of that bag. And so one of them comes along and it takes an apple. Another one comes along and takes an apple. That's fine. But then the next two come along. Which one wins? Does the one on the left go first and get an apple and the one on the right fail? Or does the one on the right go first and get an apple and the one on the left fails? Um, so concurrent modifications start making things a little bit complicated. And it gets a bit worse than that because concurrent modifications can even cause us to lose data and make things we think are totally simple operations behave in unexpected ways. Uh, the example I'm going to use is just adding an element to an array list. Uh, and so this is all about thread safety in Java. So array list is designed for uh, operating only within a single thread. If we have multiple threads, we can have problems. So this is uh, my uh, little example of two threads. And we can imagine that request A and request B are parallel requests that have come in. They're running on some web server. And uh, request A starts first. 
But request B starts a bit later and it catches up because these are in parallel. And request B happens to finish first and then request A uh, finishes afterwards. And so th this is parallelism in action and we can't predict very easily what order these instructions are going to happen in. Now, a Java ArrayList is something that uh, it's designed so that you can interface it like a list. Uh, you can add things to it. You can get the entry that it's at a particular element and uh, it is backed internally by an array but it's going to manage the size of the array for you and so what normally happens is so in this case I've got my array list and that's its internal array and it is full of the values a and b and a request comes in to add the value c and so what Java's array list does it goes oh all right I want to add c on the end but my backing array is full so I'm going to need to allocate myself a new array I'm going to need to copy across A and B and then I can stick C on it and now that is going to be my new array list backing the array and you'll notice that it's kept some spare space at the end it doubles the size of the array every time lovely if you're in a single threaded scenario but if you are in a parallel scenario something really awkward can sometimes very rarely happen and what happens is suppose we've got two threads, request A and request B, and they are both looking to add their data, C and D, onto this array list. And let's suppose that request A goes first. And so, all right, we're adding C to the array list. I see the backing array is full. So I'm going to allocate a new one. I'm going to put A and B in there, and then I can stick C on the end. And, oh, and at the worst possible moment, that thread gets interrupted. And request B is having a go. Oh, we've not we've not copied the array back in. That 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 A B C is is no longer is is not being made the backing array for the array. The, the backing array for it's still A and B. A request B takes place and it says add D. And the code inside array list says, oh, I see my backing array is full. I need to create a new one. I need to copy A and B into it. And I need to put D in that. And now let's uh, make that the new backing array for my array. And we're done. And request A takes over, and where was it up to? Oh yes, it was up to copying the back, moving the back array, uh, array to be the array for that data. And so in that little operation, request A added C, request B added D. It's just adding an element to an array list, but the parallelism means that we've lost D. Uh, just we got interrupted at the wrong time and the, the array never got made the backing array for the array list until there was a competing one. So in Java's situation, if you use um, data structures that are mutable and are not thread safe and you use them from parallel threads, you can have unexpected things like this happen. You wouldn't expect an add not to have added the data. Um, Next, well, because these processors, they're multi-core, um, so there was my picture of a simple processor, and I said that it was connected to memory. But my simple processor is not really a simple processor. That processor these days might have four processing cores. Each of those processing cores might have a little local cache of memory to try and make it run faster. And so that means that my variable that I'm wanting to modify might be in five places at once. It might be in memory where it's supposed to be, but also cached on any or all of those different uh, core, uh, processor core caches. And so then, well, my processor wants to update the value of that variable. Which one does it update? Um, and that's kind of a curious question. And in fact, recent versions of Java have a keyword for this. Uh, the volatile keyword means that the Java virtual machine has to enforce a happens before relationship with subsequent reads of the same variable. In other words, it forces it to go and write it back into main memory and it forces any of the other ones to go back to main memory rather than just the local cache uh, to read the value. So it, uh, it, it, it can't do that optimization of just using the version that's in the, the, the local cache uh, on that particular core. So our simple model isn't really true anymore. Uh, we had this model that we were issuing instructions that were executed in order and it nicely matched train stations and it nicely matched a naive model of how a processor might work. But it's not, just not true. The compiler is changing my code, uh, although it outwardly looks like it behaves the same mostly. Um, the uh, 
compilers and processes make optimizations that outwardly appear to be uh, behave the same. Uh, they're limited in which ones they can do and there's some trade-offs and so for instance the Java virtual machine has these two optimizers uh, one of which takes a bit longer it does a bit more work but is usually more efficient at optimization and so it has to make a trade-off between running your code straight away and investing some time in optimizing it first and um, some of the other trade-off examples that you get in other languages so C Python has a very simple model of how it does parallelism which is that well actually it doesn't um, there is a thing called a global interpreter lock which means that though you can write parallel code in python if you are running in c python or at least in um maybe they've changed this more recently i don't think they have i think this is still true of c python that you could write parallel code in it but it wouldn't actually run in parallel only one thread would ever be executing at once no matter how many processes or cores uh your uh your computer had um there's this other trade-off that the java just-in-time compiler it turns out that it can outperform static compilation um, so one of the the reasons this is the case is uh, if, if I let you in the slides go back to one of the first optimizations uh, that the uh, that was done in the example it was called inline final method and you might notice final as in the final keyword that's in Java but we don't often actually write final against our getters on objects uh, so theoretically in the code there could be some other code that goes and overrides that method well the Java the Java virtual machine at the time it's running your code it's running your code it's got all the classes loaded and it can know whether or not you did override that method and so it can decide look I know you didn't mark that method as being final but in the code you've got me running, nobody has overrid uh, overridden it. Nobody has uh, over overridden that method in a subclass. And so I'm just going to treat it like it is a final method. And I'm going to apply the optimizations that I would apply if you had marked that method as being final. But there's a little bit of a trade-off. So this makes the Java uh, virtual machines just-in-time compiler nice and efficient, uh, means that we can write in a friendly uh, managed memory language but still get relatively good execution speeds. Um, but to the operating system, it has this little problem that that means that the program that it's executing is data. The program it's executing isn't the output of Java C, the program it's executing is the output of, well, when you ran Java and sometime during the program, it did some compilation and wrote some instructions into memory. And now it would like you to execute those instructions. And unfortunately, of course, that's the same thing that uh, buffer overflow attacks rely on. Viruses use it to change their code and hide. And so this is a security risk. It makes it harder for operating systems to analyze code and know it's safe because the code it's really executing isn't written until runtime. Um, so there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Okay, that is probably about as complex as I would like to go for this introduction. The take-home message of this is just that we've got this imperative model about instructions executed in order uh, mutating data that we think is nice and simple. But in modern processors, modern compilers, and modern situations of parallelism, all sorts of other issues come up and some of those issues are really quite complicated and so if this has seemed complicated the question for next time is what if we used a different model where we didn't have to worry about that what if we had a different way of thinking about our program where we could let the compiler do all its optimizations we could let it run in parallel and not have to worry about strangeness going on because of it